Good morning, everybody. Morning. But you're all very well behaved. I only have to say it once. Okay. Um, welcome to day two of the Academic and Special Libraries Conference and Exhibition. My name is Marie Cullen, and I'm on the committee, and <clears throat> I'm chairing this morning's session. Uh, welcome back to everybody who was here yesterday and to the people who are here for uh, today. Um, I also want to uh, welcome uh, uh, Saoirse Reynolds and Celine Campbell, who were here yesterday and today. Uh, they're the bursary winners. Um, you might have noticed people are wearing different coloured badges. So I have a green one. So anyone with a green badge is a, a committee member. Speakers are wearing purple badges. Sponsors yellow and delegates white. Um, firstly, I want to thank the sponsors and I want to remind you to visit the sponsor stands which are in here in the room on the left. Um, tea and coffee is served in there uh, today. There is a quiz sheet in the delegate bag and you need to go to each of the sponsors to fill to get the answers to that quiz. So we'd encourage you to do so because without their support it would be very difficult to uh, put on the conference. Uh, the vote uh, for or the quiz finishes uh, just before lunch, so if you do that uh, at the tea break, it would be uh, great. And the prize is a voucher for a meal here in the Radisson. Um, so any member of the committee would probably be delighted to go with any delegate who wins it. So just remember to do that. And just to remind you, our sponsors are uh, our platinum sponsors, IEEE, and they've been sponsored since 2011, and ProQuest sponsored since 2011 also. Uh, gold sponsored LM Information uh, Delivery, this is their second year, and Taylor and Francis, third year, and Dawson Books have sponsored us since 2014. And then Silver are EBSCO, and they've sponsored us since 2010. Interleaf were sponsors also in 2014. Uh, DBS, Dublin Business School, this is their second year, and they're promoting the Masters in Information and Library Management. And just again to emphasise, we would really appreciate if you take the time to go and visit and talk to them and uh, do the quiz. So a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, there are emergency exits here, here, and here, and here. And if there is an emergency, which we hope there won't be, please follow the directions of the, the hotel staff. Uh, the Twitter hashtag is a hashtag ASL2016, and it was trending yesterday, and Laura was very happy about that. <laughs> and there's a prize for the best tweet, so we encourage you to get tweeting. Um, I don't know what the prize is, but... Uh, there is one. <laughs> also to remind you about the uh, poster exhibition and competition, the posters are out in the hall and we had a good ses session yesterday evening, uh, lots of interest in the posters and uh, there is a blue sheet in your delicate bags, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, you can use that to vote uh, for your uh, favourite poster. I was asked by somebody, can you vote for your own institution on the basis that if you stood for election you could vote for yourself, I think yes you probably can. So. <laughs> You're safe enough. So that closes at four o'clock and we'd really encourage people to put a lot of hard work into them and it's uh, an integral part of the, um, the conference so we'd really encourage you to, uh, to do that. Um, the parallel sessions are in the field suite and the swift suite so, and any of you who were here yesterday will know that they're upstairs for, for those who, <laughs> haven't, uh, who weren't here yesterday. Uh, you go out into the lobby and uh, go up the stairs uh, but there will be signs and you can ask any member of the uh, committee. And refreshment breaks um, are in here where the sponsors are on my left and Goldsmith Tree and lunch is in the restaurant um, uh, today. Okay, so I'm going to introduce our uh, keynote speaker for this morning. And uh, it's Dr. Sandra Collins. And Sandra is director of the National Library of Ireland. Uh, she's told me this morning that she's six months in the post. So she started in August of last year. And uh, Sandra is originally a mathematician. Uh, but uh, is interested in all things digital and cultural heritage. She's also founding director of the Digital Repository of Ireland, uh, which was based in the Royal Irish uh, Academy. And uh, in 2014, she was one of Silicon Republic's top 100 women in technology. Um, some of you may be familiar with DRI. Um, it's involved in things like Inspiring Ireland and Linked Log Adam. So you may have come across Sandra's work and involvement uh, indirectly. Sandra is going to talk about learning while building a new strategy for the National Library. So I will ask you to give a very warm welcome to Dr. Sandra Collins. So thanks.
Thanks very much. As Marie said, I still feel like the new girl on the block, six months in, but um, loving every second of it. And I'm very grateful for the chance to come here and, um, and talk to you. I've always found of the different communities that I've worked across, the library community is absolutely the most welcoming and warmest. So thank you very much. <laughs> Um, I'm going to talk about, I think, well, I hope, um, some kind of big issues for libraries as we move into a digital age, as things change, what should change and what should stay the same. I'm going to put it in the frame of um, developing our new strategy for the National Library, but I think the issues that we face in doing that um, are really very common across the library sector. So what I hope is there'll be a lot of resonance and, um, and common thoughts around the room here because you'll have struggled with uh, some of the same issues. Okay, so I should introduce myself and the National Library. So what is the National Library? Um, so, um, the National Library means slightly different things. I've done the awful thing of taking um, the uh, definition from Wikipedia, so forgive me for that. Um, but it turns out it's not uh, really a common uh, definition across the sector, but the, the, the bones of it is, it's a library set up by the government of a country, and it should be the primary repository for information for that country. Um, it seems terrible to define yourself by what you, what you don't do, but the National Library tends not to um, borrow, to lend books. And um, the idea, the goal, I suppose, is that the National Library would hold the um, rare, valuable, significant collections of the country. In Ireland, the National Collection sits between um, these two very strong library communities, academic and special libraries, I suppose we're special as well, and the public libraries. In some different countries around the world, um, the National Library sits with the public libraries or it sits with the academic, but um, here in Ireland it has a kind of a, a little space in between. So, uh, introduce ourselves. Um, uh, we're quite old and we're quite new. So, um, the National Library was set up in 1877 from the RDS. So, this is the amazing collecting activities of the RDS left, led to a really fabulous library that um, the government then designated under, this is um, when we were a colony of Britain, under UK administration, uh, designated that library as the National Library. We got our own building, and that's a picture of it from um, 1890, but I was thinking, as I walked up the road today, it doesn't actually look that different. Um, and we moved out of Leinster House, where RDS was, and, uh, and opened up there. And then, you know, the Irish state develops the foundation of the state. Um, uh, we saw some growth in the building itself. When we entered into the building, it wasn't fully complete and it wasn't dimensioned to hold uh, what was anticipated would come to it. And um, I suppose over time, that full development never really happened. The idea of the government in the day was that uh, there wasn't quite enough money available at the moment, but there might be in the future. Um, and I suppose that's still, uh, to some extent, where we are now. Um, we grew over Kildare Street in the 1970s, and um, coming up to 2000, the National Photographic Archive opened, and maybe that's in some way um, a significant thing for the library because it starts to move into the idea of exhibition and um, uh, move, offer another service to the reading rooms and the idea of studying in the building. And then why I say we're kind of new, well we got our um, uh, legislation and became our own cultural institution with the board in 2005. One of the things I'm going to say later is the effect, um, just briefly touch on the effect of politics on libraries, what's the challenge there? So I might mention that uh, when we started, um, the library was under the care of the Department of Science and Arts. In the 1980s we moved to the Department of Taoiseach. Um, in uh, 1992, we went to arts, culture and the Gael Talked. then we were in sports and tourism, back to arts, heritage and the Gael Talked. now. We've never actually been in the Department of Education, which, um, I don't know, is somewhat of a surprise, perhaps. And I have to put up the picture of the reading room, because I suppose if you've been in the buildings, it's the thing that um, really um, stands out as the image of the National Library. Okay, so I might just look at numbers for a while because I think numbers are very important for libraries. Um, this is the kind of um, our stats, our users. This is what it looks like for um, 2014. 
Um, if I try to, um, you know, we count stuff, everybody counts stuff, very important to count things. And you, when, as soon as you count something, you have to report it to someone. If I look at these numbers, what I would say is they show that we've got millions, tens of millions of visitors online. So that's an entirely um, new and evolving um, means of engagement, a new audience, a new user group for us. Um, I think this year we'll probably get about two, we'll probably break the 200,000 visitors through the door for exhibitions and so on. So we have the research visits and the reading rooms and that's core activity of the National Library. But these figures show that there are two other really important avenues for us and that's online and, um, and through the door for exhibitions and so on. Now, I did, um, for my sins, work in a funding agency um, um, uh, previously, and one of the things that you know about funding and, and reporting is that metrics can take on a life of their own, so that the goal of measuring something becomes a thing of value in itself, and it's a substitute for expressing um, the value of the organisation. So one of the things I want to talk about during the talk is what is the value of a library and um, do those numbers represent it? And I don't think, I, I think they do somewhat and they're important, but they definitely don't capture all the value of a library. Much harder to do that and it's up to everybody in this room to contribute into that argument of what is the value of a library. Um, I think particularly as um, we come under pressure from different, um, uh, you know, threats and competitors as the world changes. Okay, so who's the National Library for? Well, it's definitely for the scholar or the professional researcher. I think it's really important to say that it's for the amateur researcher as well. So we've a lot of people that are interested in genealogy and heraldry coming through the door, and they're not academics, like um, uh, an awful lot of you will be dealing with in the universities and the higher education institutions. But, um, you know, the argument of who's more important, the scholar or the amateur, I mean, do we have to say which is more important? Can we just say perhaps the amateur researcher needs a bit more help and so we should give them more of our time? So I suppose in saying who's the audience of the library, any library, it's really behind it there's some very complex arguments about what's your priority, what's important to you, who you serve, who you give the most service to, and what you prioritise. But we can start by saying who they are anyway. So for us as well, we have schools, young people, learning, we have a big learning programme. Um, the interested public, so um, it's public institution, people wander in the door for, um, perhaps for the cafe, um, hope for the um, exhibitions and so on, and they have some form of an experience. I think it's also important that we think of the uninterested public, so the people that don't come in through the door looking for something may wander in, by mistake perhaps, um, or may engage with a library this year more than other years in 2016 because of the big focus on uh, the commemorations around 1916. And then we're based in Dublin, uh, but we're a national library, so how do we get to the whole of Ireland? And, um, and what does it mean to be Irish anyway? Like, um, this is the, the, the goal of reaching the diaspora and everybody around the world who has an interest in Ireland. And I guess that's what the digital revolution allows us to do now, which absolutely, you know, was so much more difficult in the past, that we can get around the world. Can't always offer the same experience, but we can open up the doors in a virtual or a digital sense. Now, any of those questions there, who it's for, I would say it's for everybody there. But um, there is, realistically, if you don't have um, thousands of staff and um, a massive budget, you have to make some picking and choosing in that, and you have to find an offering and tailor it to what you can do for professional researchers, amateur schools, the, the, the public people, and what you can offer around the world. And every one of those decisions means somebody gets something and somebody doesn't. Somebody, and those are hard decisions, and what can we do to make the best decisions for that? Okay, so our mission, this is the boring slide. Um, so that's our, uh, the first one um, is our mission um, um, as we promote it on our website, like it's our official mission. Um, and it is about, um, I think what every library is about, collect, preserve and make accessible. So get stuff, keep it safe and let people use it. Um, and, um, and then because we're the National Library, it should be the um, documentary that's, um, 
well, you know what documentary is, an intellectual record of the life of Ireland. I prefer the second version that we're kind of um, uh, evolving to because it's more... Um, uh, evocative or emotional and um, it's you know the use uh, talking about libraries as memory institutions as holding the memory of nations and um, I just love that idea it's so um, you know everybody has a, an immediate emotional connection with um, memory so I, I, I like that now just to say about your mission every organization has a mission but that's not the same as saying what your value is and the problem with saying what your mission is, you kind of implicitly assume that everybody knows what your value is. I'm going to keep coming back to this. What's the value of libraries? And how do we express it? And how can we get people to engage with that and really appreciate it? Because your mission is definitely not. Um, it's built on the assumption that everybody knows the value of libraries. And that's why they would bother reading this. Or that's why they would come in the door. Or why they would engage with you in any form. And I suppose for our mission, um, I'm going to say what should change and what should stay the same. Is that a valid mission? Um, it's, um, I don't know how old it is, but I guess it's at, le it's at least 10 years old um, since the, the, the website goes up and it's promoted in that way. Is it equally valid now and uh, should we be thinking about changing it? So let's look, that's looking in um, and introducing uh, myself and the National Library to you. Let's look out now. So let's look at the world around us. Um, so talked about the mission of the National Library, um, but let's just generalise that for mission of libraries overall. And you're talking about a 5,000 year old mission. So you talk about, um, um, you know, Coke having a really clear mission and they've had it for a long time. Um, well, 5,000 years uh, really um, socks that one um, into the far court. So libraries have an enduring mission at their heart. Um, I hope I, I have this captured so that everybody here says, yeah, that, that's it. And the, the fundamental part of it is collect, preserve, and share. Um, and I suppose our challenge is not the mission. Our challenge is if we still have that mission and it's still equally valid, how do we do it as the world around us changes? So. Um, if I say it's a 5,000 year old mission, let me give some uh, validation to that. So um, we have 30,000 clay tablets in uh, Mesopotamia uh, 5,000 years ago. So that's where I'm working off. People always think of the Library of Alexandra. Um, in Nineveh, we have about 700 BC, um, maybe the first library classification system. So it's not just collections and stuff, it's really core library work. And the example everybody um, always refers to is the Great Library of Alexandra, uh, 300 BC, absolutely. Um, I don't know if you classify it as a national library, but they definitely set themselves the goal of uh, collecting all the documentary heritage, um, where documentary means scrolls and papyrus. Um, Ptolemy I asked all the neighbouring uh, neighboring, um, kings and governors to send him all their unique works. And there's some lovely stories about um, they confiscated um, any book that they didn't already have in the library from tourists and visitors um, into Alexandria. So I love that story, and I think we should do that in the National Library as well. <laughs> Um, <laughs> at its height, so the Great, Alex, uh, the Great Library of Alexandra um, maybe had 750,000 scrolls, and that is, um, there must have been duplicates in there, so a lot of core library work there in um, uh, stock taking and assessing and appraising your collections and uh, perhaps getting rid of duplicates. Um, and when we say, you know, scrolls, um, they would have been papyrus and um, maybe leather, and they were stored in uh, pigeonholes with the titles hanging down off a little um, wooden tag hanging off the edge. So it's really lovely. I'd love to show you a photo of it, but of course I can't do that. Um, but it's a lovely image of um, the start of libraries. Okay, so an old mission. Here's the library. This is what it looks like now. Um, and that's what it looked like then. That's around 1916. So um, somewhat changed, but um, perhaps largely unchanged. Um, and if we say the mission shouldn't change, the world changes, what about value? How is that changing? So I have a lovely quote here. Um, the writer, Sean of uh, was a member of the Board of Trust.
trustees of the National Library and he talked about the value of libraries. He said what is important about a library is not just the books or the manuscripts or the photographs or all the riches that are in the library, rather it's the creativity and the learning of it, so it's a two-way dynamic. What he said the value is the way in which the library's extraordinary collections provoke, inspire, support and challenge everyone who crosses our real or virtual thresholds to create memories, to write, to discuss, to learn, to share, and to question. That always gives me chills across my shoulder when I, when I read that. So, you know, the value of any library is not those metrics and numbers that we all count for the number of people through the door, the number of orders, the number of. That's the value, isn't it? But it's much, much harder to capture that and express that, and um, I suppose to the powers that be, to be able to quantify and somehow make a measure of it where it's indisputable. So let's look a bit, so what's the value of a library? So there is a real strong sense of an intrinsic value, that it has a value all of itself without having to contribute into other ways that we measure value, revenue generation, commercialization, jobs created. Those are the ones that um, jump into my head in, with, with Irish policy and, and, um, and practice at the moment. Um, it's a public good, so both um, in the um, preservation and sharing of a public good, which is knowledge, but it's for the good of the public, a very strong sense of a public service. Um, things that are important then are the value for money for the public. Um, a challenge, I suppose, is to quantify that value, to be able to express it. Um, and not to get lost in what you can measure. So the things that you can measure are a part of your value. I'm not saying they're not, but they are the easy way to do it. And let's not chase the numbers. So you need to distinguish between the metrics, which can, in a sense, be the perceived value, and the actual value, much harder to do, but really, really important. Because what I would like to express for libraries is um, our value to learning, research, culture, and society. And those are so important and so intrinsic. And, you know, at times, they really are at risk. So value of the library, I guess, I, I, you may put your hands up if I'm wrong, but is everybody in this room, because as they were growing up, they love books? <laughs> right, okay, so everybody has a favourite book quote. So what, does, what, what, what is the value there, and for next generation, for children, for students, the younger people that are coming through the doors, can we keep that value alive for them and keep that appreciation there for them? Okay, so if we look outside, what is the stuff in our environment that influences um, what we do? Um, so lots and lots of stuff going on. Uh, libraries right at the hub of a number of different um, pressures and changes. Technology and digital, absolutely. You knew I'd say that. And um, everybody in the room, I guess, worries about this or sees it as an opportunity, sees it as a worry, what are we gonna do? That's the big thing I would say for libraries. But we also have political, economical, um, social and societal engagement, changing public expectations and things, politics and, and legislation and a whole load of complex things that come together and what I hope is they're not squeezing us into a place where everybody else is telling us what we have to be. So if I think about political, you're talking about the government of the day's priorities and policies. Um, if you're within a bigger institution, like a, um, an IT or a university, then you've the policy um, and the politics of that. Um, you've your national networks um, and you've your international networks. And everybody has a kind of overarching view or a policy or something that you're you know, you have to fit into, you don't have to, you can be separate and apart, but you do want to know how you fit relative to those things. Um, it's a complex ecosystem, I suppose. Uh, economic, I mean, uh, does it need any elaboration? I'd be surprised if there's anybody that wants to complain about their budget keeps growing. Um, so assuming that um, everybody's budget is being squeezed, then even the way in which it's squeezed affects what we can do. So if it's your acquisition budget that's under threat, you know the impact of that. Maybe it's your staff numbers and you can't move that, then you know that's a fundamental impact on your services you can provide and morale across the organization. Maybe it's capital and you can't fix the hole in the roof and that's going to be a problem on an ongoing basis. Like you'll be feeling the pain of that, not just this year, but into the future as well. So I don't have any answers for that one at all. <laughs> 
Okay, so I want to talk a little bit more about the digital revolution, but I'm going to frame it or compare it with the print revolution. Not in a surprising analogy, but I think... Um, you know, it's very important to put what we're in the middle of in context. So if we look back at the print revolution, Johannes Gutenberg um, invents the printing press in 1452, absolutely transformative. So now you can get greater access, but to better, more consistent, higher quality information. So it's not just access, it's the quality of the information. And, um, you know, I, I suppose there's a general understanding that the printing press leads us into the Renaissance and leads us into the Reformation. So it's a, an enlightening and then a challenging and reflective period enabled by sharing information. If I look at the pictures, so the first one is the main Psalter, one of the first books um, ever produced with the movable printing, uh, the movable type printing press. Um, and when you look at that, it doesn't look like a book, it looks like a manuscript. And the first printers were careful to reproduce the style of manuscripts, including, you know, things like, um, you know, the uniqueness and the errors and so on. So they, they, they wanted it to look like what you were used to before. Maybe uh, 40 um, years after that, you're into more mainstream printing, but it's still specialist books. So it's maybe like the equivalent of the academic press now. This is um, an example of um, a travel book, and it's moved into the kind of, it's moving towards the layout that we're more um, associate with the book. But it's nearly 100 years after the invention that you look at um, something that looks like a book as we think of it. So that's a horticultural book. It's got, you know, images, text, it's laid out. That's what we think of as a book. And it's really very different than the initial things. So what I'm saying here is the print revolution happens in a moment. You invent the printing press. It takes 100 years before it settles down and you can look back on it. It's a luxury for us to look back on it now and say, oh, yeah, that really changed things. But as you lived through it, you didn't know where it was going to end up. And that's a hundred years. So I guess what I'm saying is I think that that's what we're going through right now in the digital revolution. And we're probably about 40 years into it. So if we say the digital revolution is the same thing, it's transformative because it's greater access to better information um, uh, and, and, and faster. I think the, the pace probably is, is, is really exceptional here as well. Starts with the invention of the PC. So you're looking at little mini kits people can make themselves. That's about 1975 Intel chips. Then you get the internet. This lovely story about Tim Berners-Lee working in CERN and putting his proposal to his boss for the ARPANET, which would turn into the internet, and the boss writing in the margin, vague but interesting. So um, and here we are now. I guess everybody's um, uh, logged onto the internet there. So um, the first iPhone is only 2007, like that's just the other day. So I would say we're right in the middle of this. All the apps, all the location services, all the social media, this is going very fast right now and we don't know where it's ending up. So if I parallel it to the books, we're in the developers phase. We're not at the finishers and we don't know where we're going. Um, that's a 3D printer. I mean, what is that going to, uh, what difference is that going to make when that comes into mainstream as opposed to experimental? And aside from all that, which is just interesting to think about, what does it mean for libraries? One of the big changes for libraries is that everybody can consume and publish instantly. So there's some really big questions here, I think, about the quality of information and the difference between, um, if anybody's tweeting something there, what does that mean? What, you know, is that work preserving? Is that really um, a, an important thing? Or so I'm going with no, but then um, on the other hand, um, it's a part of the record um, of this uh, network of the ASL and this conference, and if that's worth um, uh, preserving and keeping, then yes, the tweet is as well. So um, there's some really fundamental questions there about the quality of information, the speed of information, the trust of information. But the one thing I suppose you can see in that picture is there's no point um, questioning the volume of information. This thing is growing really, really fast, and it's changing generationally um, what people think of as information and how they engage with it. And it's a, it's a big deal for libraries. So digital is hugely disruptive and transformative. That's a very exciting time to live through. We should all be um, blessed with it. Um, uh, but um, it's hard to see now how it's going to play out and how it will end. So if we said the mission of libraries was these three really core things, uh, collect, preserve, share, 
um, digital impacts uh, what we collection, what we collect, um, how we preserve and how we share. It impacts all parts of the core mission. Let me dig into that a little more. So there's, uh, that's what we collect in the National Library. Um, books, newspapers, manuscripts, uh, prints, drawings, correspondence, ephemera and photographs. Now, that's still true, but each one of those things has a digital equivalent and it has a digitized equivalent and it has a born digital, a brand new thing that um, didn't exist uh, 10 years ago. So I just I made a short list and I'm pretty sure I only got half it. Um, E-books, E-pubs, um, digital newspapers, photos, documents, the stuff which doesn't have a physical surrogate like your email and your website and um, all the multimedia and um, not even thinking about what we can do about moving image and stuff like that and then even if you say um, ebooks there's all the different formats of it so it's not like it's just paper it's all the different formats so we have the same job that we always had but the world changed and that just made the job I don't know at least 10 times bigger Oh, and I didn't say research data as well. Um, and that's, you know, massive challenge, I would say, for the learning and the, the academic and the higher education um, libraries. Absolutely massive um, challenge and um, really one for the future because um, the multiplier and the amount of information that you're trying to capture there is massive. And this is what a web archive looks like. We do this in the National Library. Um, I don't know if it looks very exciting. It does a little bit to me, because uh, I love this stuff. Um, but what we do is um, we capture the, um, we try to capture the web history um, and the web now of, um, of Ireland. So three big steps to that. We, we do it in partnership with the Internet Memory Foundation. We did a full web crawl in 2007, and we hope to do one on the 10 year anniversary of that, and that's everything. But generally, it's quite labor intensive, and we do it on a selected thematic basis. So we pick websites and we save them. That's a really big, uh, complicated job, as you can imagine. There's a whole um, mountain of appraisal involved in that, um, and rights clearance and things like that. But um, for example, what we're doing right now is the general election and all the websites around that you'll be glad to hear after the election is over and um, the websites will vanish within like two to three days particularly the unsuccessful candidates so you got to get them right now or you they'll be gone and gone forever um, so there's a big appraisal and uh, a rights clearance issue. What we actually do at the moment is we have a takedown policy. So we ask you if we can preserve your website, and um, if you don't, um, if we don't get a definitive answer from you, but we feel it's in the national interest, we'll capture it and we'll do takedown afterwards. And that's an evolution of that policy as well. Uh, the capture and preservation is done with the Internet Foundation. There's a lot of QA involved. The interface is something we want to work on because we'd like to do it a more um, themed and exhibition, you know, something a bit more um, engaging. Okay, I talked in the digital repository, I talked about digital preservation for four years, so I'm going to contain myself right now. Um, I will just say that it is absolutely a really massive challenge, and it's not a thing you can do passively. It requires a lot of planning. It's... Um, the policy, the strategy, it's the tech for sure, and it's how your staff implement it in the libraries. And the, you know, you have all the threats of the bit rot, digital obsolescence, you can't open. If you have your thesis from 10 years ago on a, um, 10 years ago I guess is a um, three and a half, uh, no, a, um, a small one, you know, the small disc, um, you probably struggle to find a machine you could open it on. If you have your thesis on a floppy disc, I'd say you're doomed. Um, anyway, okay, so a huge amount to work involved in that and these two common misconceptions that really really have been picked up particularly by technology companies that um, that's okay I published it on the web so it's preserved absolutely definitely not and of course a memory stick is not digital preservation your memory stick won't be um, usable in 10 years time either so I contain myself I could spend another half an hour but I'll hold back this is a picture from the library collections of um, the destruction of, um, it's from the Civil War in 1922, and uh, it's the destruction of the Four Courts and the Public Records Office. Now that was a willful destruction intending to make um, a hole in the public record and the, the history of our nation. Um, what we lost there is um, Irish census returns, um, wills from the 16th century, um, more than a thousand Church of Ireland parish registers, um, a lot of, there's a hole in our history because of that. Um, but that was intended, you know, it was an act 
And my question is, I suppose, to everybody here, are we passively doing that right now to the record of our country by not digitally preserving it and putting all the, um, the plans and activity into that? Are we equally doing the same thing right now by, by passivity, by not caring enough? Actually, I don't want to say that in the library audience. I bet everybody here cares, but you don't have the resources, the staff, the technology. So let me not say in this audience that anybody doesn't care, but you know, outside in the broader audience, I fear there isn't enough understanding and um, active caring about this. Okay, so that's collecting, that's preserving, and now let's talk about sharing. So I guess this one is the most clearest and the one that we've made the most progress on. Digital sharing, if I think of online um, publication, is um, absolutely, um, at the moment, you can see how transformative it is. You can reach vast numbers that you couldn't have before. If I look in the library, we published the Catholic parish registers, um, and that would have been um, a service that people would have come in through the door. Um, small numbers, but very keen researchers. Now it's online, we've had six million visits, and it can reach around the world. So we get lovely stories back of someone in Australia who found their mother or their mother's mother and that kind of thing. So that's something that wouldn't have been possible before. People talk a lot about the democratisation of knowledge. I think that's really important. I do think we need to be a little bit mindful when we say that, that um, it's a democracy with everybody in it as long as they have access to sufficient income and education. So let's not forget, aside from you know, um, Donegal or parts of the country that don't have good enough in internet um, access, um, not picking on Donegal, but um, uh, let's look outside of, let's, let's not do that thing where we think everybody else is like us and is um, educated and um, has enough income that the internet is a, an assumption rather than a gift. Now it's a different experience, so it's not the same as coming through the door, um, and there's pluses and minuses with that. Um, I guess everybody that has a Kindle um, uh, probably has that moment where they go, I wish that was a paper book and I could smell the book. Um, so it is a different experience. It has some advantages that you can't do with the physical, so you can do stuff for um, uh, visually impaired, or you can do stuff, um, you know, this, um, you can use technology to get into a depth and a zoom and things like that. So there's, there's extra things you can do, but I think the most important thing is not to say one is better than the other but to say that they're different and that's just really online publication and people coming to you looking for information and being able to find it then you have social media as well which is a form of active sharing so that you can promote and you can push out your content so people can engage with it and even if we say that that's hugely transformative and has made a ma massive difference so far, that's, we're not really nailed on the complexities and, and some really challenging issues behind that. So I'm not far from an expert, but um, the things I would flag are illegal deposit, that we don't have that legislation here and really, really need it. Moved ahead in the UK and we're definitely trailing behind that. Copyright reform, um, I'm not going to go into you know, the, the parts of it that, that the community is crying out for, but really to say the principle of digital sharing is really different than printed sharing and why doesn't copyright come up to date to allow those you know a different way of working and then you have these really really complex and, and hugely interesting issues like um, the right to be forgotten and what does it mean um, to withdraw your um, published presence um, okay, and that's just sharing, which is relatively passive. Digital also allows these um, really, really interesting new ways of engagement. So um, even the title, I think, is not fixed. So you, I see um, these different ways of expressing it. So citizen engagement, crowd engagement, public engagement, societal engagement, all those things. I think the wording is very important because it um, excludes or includes you, whether you feel like a part of that. Um, and the many ways then in which people can actively engage with content now includes um, you can contribute content, so you can digitise your photo and upload it, um, public annotation, so people can e contribute expert input into the content, you can transcribe, you can do um, public interpretation and narrative around those things. And you might be saying, yeah, but that's the public, and um, they can say anything. <laughs> 
Um, and that's true, but you can also do, um, you can use your crowdsourcing and your citizens or your public um, to, uh, to bring in measures of quality control and validation through um, kind of numbers of people that agree. There's really lots of innovative stuff there. I think it's a huge impact for libraries and I hope that we can engage with it in a positive way. We can bring it into the library rather than be um, uh, um, nervous of it. I do think it's important. If we say that the library's value is about the quality of the information, so this comes back to you know somebody treating random gibberish versus the first manuscript of blah 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 that's in your library. What's the difference between those two pieces of information? Well, I like the first manuscript. Um, and is the library's value um, really how much of it resides in the quality, the authority, and the trusted nature of the information that we provide? And when we work with the public, is that a plus or a minus? Does it diminish our value? Can it add to our value? And how can we bring it together to make um, a joint endeavour? Um, okay, and that's us. That's the, um, our Flickr um, uh, stream. Um, we get about 40 million um, uh, visits to Flickr and um, started it as an experiment and it's now really an important um, engagement tool for us. Um, the, 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 the selecting of images and the engaging with the community is now done by volunteers and I suppose that's another aspect of the, um, uh, the engagement with the public is when you don't have enough staff and if anybody has too many staff could they put their hands up and um, so if you don't have as many staff to do all the things you want to do you can use your public engagement as a volunteer workforce now you know there's all sorts of questions about that too I guess I'm asking more questions than answers um, if I think about competitors for libraries, so part of your value, understanding your value and being able to explain it, is equally um, understanding who your competitors are. So I started, you know, doing a list here. So um, Google, that's the idea of um, information on demand um, and just being able to search on your phone. Um, and for, you know, a, um, a naive user or a non-professional user to not be able to distinguish between the quality of the information they get. Um, Amazon, so um, it's lovely to see Amazon now has um, their um, bookstore um, in Seattle, um, so um, they, you know, addressing the issue of the experience of buying a book versus ordering online, and that's very interesting for them. I know there's a lot of concern for independent um, booksellers and so on over that. So I think we have to say they're a form of competition. Um, and then for the National Library, do, um, do we have to say the academic libraries are our competition, or uh, you see my voice is sad, um, or the public libraries? Um, and in fact, then, um, if we have to say that, do we have to say every other publicly funded organisation and service? So if I'm arguing for, we would love to do this project, could we please have the funds for it? Um, am I taking away a hospital bed um, somewhere in the country? I don't want to do that. So competition is terrible. But, you know, if you can find a way to partner with it and rise above it and express your value independent of that, um, then you're on the right path. I don't have any answers here either, but um, I suppose the thing is to look if we can turn each one of those things into a partner instead of a threat. And that takes energy and a common understanding as well. And the other things I would say is the changing business models in publishing and media and, and how people consume online. Like that's, that's definitely, we're still in the middle of that. That's a really massive impact for libraries and I don't think that's played out to the end. Um, I think across the world, um, the you know economic pressure leads to very short-term policy. So what does that do for us right now? And libraries are inherently longer term endeavors you know and the short term policy does not suit library goals and vision and mission which is a really long term commitment and then the public expectations so i mean i suppose this is really where um uh, google creates a paradigm shift for libraries if you can Google it and get the answer immediately, and um, you know, we still have this question of whether it is actually the answer or it's what the you know most people on the internet clicked on as the answer, and the difference between those two things. But if that's okay, and you take that and you don't go further to a library or trusted source of um, uh, quality information, then uh, yes, then 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 it definitely is a competitor.
Okay, so um, I thought I couldn't, um, I wanted to talk generally about um, uh, uh, libraries and their value and what's changing, um, and then specifically, um, we're getting started on the 2020 strategy, and I thought I'd talk a bit about that, so it's kind of bringing it back to what does all that general thinking mean for us in the National Library? So we started into um, what should our strategic priorities be? I cut to the end and say that's that's where we are. We're on strategic priorities, not strategy. Um, so the really, I, I think it's the right way to do it. The most important thing is to say what's important. You'll figure out how to get there as long as you know where you want to go. So. We might have 20 priorities, we have to make the best prioritisation. We have to narrow the scope and we have to pick what we can do. So starting into this then, it's understanding and identifying your resources, what you've got, what the good stuff is, and then what your constraints are. So what isn't possible um, now, might be in the future, what holds you back and what challenges you. And that's really across the board, I think all libraries need to know these things about themselves because it does charge what you can commit to doing. Um, trying to predict, I uh, got the glass ball out, the um, looking ball thing, um, uh, predicting the future. And how can we do that? Well, look outwards, look globally. So um, on my desk, I have a stack of um, strategies, library strategies, it's about this high. And that's trying to see what everybody else is doing. There are definitely norms and, um, and common things going on across the world. And I want to make sure that we understand that. And then we started working internally. So we worked with our department heads. And so that's you know the, the part of the library that thinks, um, you know, leads the strategy, um, the delivery and the prioritization that does this on a day-to-day -day basis for the library. We made a long list of priorities. Mm -hmm. Then we went to the function heads. So that's the layer of um, experts and people that deliver specific functions, like say in the library, um, genealogy within special collections, that kind of thing. And there we got more experts input and we went down to a short list of priorities and then um, I met with each of the teams so basically everybody in the library and said look this is what I think our priorities should be what do you think and coming into that then we got a lot of um, input and expertise really more detailed expertise people going that one is not possible and I can tell you why and equally apart from kind of factual expertise a lot of really strong opinions and that was the most um, uh, invigorating part for me to feel people have really strong opinions about what the library should be doing and how that fits in it. Now we've a load more to do. To, uh, load more to do. I'm very, very big on consultation. Still have to um, do that full consultation with the board, our stakeholders, our peer community. So everybody around us, everybody in this room, um, our users, the people who aren't our users but could be our users, and on site and online. Now, what I would say about priorities is, and this was definitely my experience in doing this with the library, it opens up really, really fundamental discussion about what does it mean to be a library. So it's right back to the values and the mission. And some of the questions that we spent lots of time talking about um, um, were things like preservation versus access, researcher versus the public, physical versus digital. Now, they're definitely not dichotomies, so you don't have to pick one and you can't do the other. That's definitely not the case. It's a spectrum, and you know the difference, the tension between preservation and access, I suppose, if I make it um, really uh, black and white. Um, if you allow people to access your um, physical collections, you're making the job of preservation much harder. Yeah? And um, if we target our services to um, expert researchers, and um, then the amateur or the visitor who wants to see an exhibition, what are they going to get? Um, and if we have a fixed budget and we want a new collection, should we digitize something or do a born digital initiative? Or should we be trying to acquire the paper archive of an author or something like that? So they're really, really questions that make you think about what the library has done, what the library should do, and your own personal emotional connection to those things. I think just that for us, we're in the spectrum. And it's still the placing, whether you're on the left or the right, you're in the middle, or you're a little bit to the, um, the edge, that really influences what you say your priorities are and how you deliver your services and how you commit your resources to what they do. 
another fabulous experience was the values of the organization. So I didn't ask anybody what their values were, but this just came up so strongly through the conversation with all the teams. And I've seen this in other libraries as well. I had the pleasure, absolute pleasure of um, doing a review of another library um, in Ireland, and it was a really fabulous experience. And um, I would say the values came through in talking to the staff there as well. So what came through for us in the National Library, welcoming, open, equal, inclusive, helpful, committed, service, all these really emotional, powerful words that speak to what you want to do and how you want to serve. It's such a virtue and you know, you don't see it across. I've worked across many different communities, but this is so strong in the library community. It's really something you should be very proud of and it's a, it's a feature. Um, okay, so if you have those values, um, how do you express them in everything you do, in your language, in your actions? I'm a big believer that the way that you talk and the words that you use speaks very strongly to what you believe and what your values are. So we want to be welcoming. That's the uh, front of the library. I want more people in there. And I don't want anybody feeling intimidated um, by the, um, the beautiful um, uh, architecture. It should be... Um, welcoming and not a barrier but that's something it doesn't happen by chance you have to make it happen we have some opportunities going on at the moment um, so 2016 is a big deal for anybody that works in cultural heritage um, and if we make it through the end of the year without everybody being tired of it it'll be great um, but it's a big national spotlight i suppose in a way that um, if we were buying media time, we'd never get the level of public interest, if, if we could do such thing, we'd never get the level of public interest in our cultural heritage. So I have to see that as an opportunity to raise the profile of the, um, the cultural institutions, National Library, the, um, the people who are the holders of the cultural heritage. We had the fabulous news before Christmas of um, a government um, commitment into our buildings and that will enable us, a big opportunity, enable us to get the collection safe and to make a better experience and a destination for our visitors and our users. Um, we're doing something at the moment, um, we're getting a bit of research done on what are the possible business opportunities for us, you know, what could we invest more in to get more back out of. And this is very controversial, I think, um, and I really want to be mindful of the messaging around that. We're a public institution, public service, public <coughs> funds, that doesn't change. But if we want to open up the Seamus Heaney archive and do a big exhibition on that, and we think the public would like that, how do we raise the funds to do that? What can we do about that? How can we offer more when we don't have enough uh, resources to do it? We're doing a lot of data gathering at the moment um, to make sure that the decisions that we make when we're making priorities match to what we see on the ground. So um, not anecdotal, but evidence-based decision making. And um, then I suppose the opportunity is really to build on what we have, our resources, our staff, our expertise, the good results that we have to date. And, um, and a big deal, I think, is um, something like the government committing to do up the buildings has had a huge morale boost in the organisation because everybody wants to feel valued and money is not value, but um, if you do get a commitment and a public commitment, it does um, give you that little boost that says, great valued. And the thing I would say about opportunities then is um, they don't happen by accident. You have to look for them all the time. You know this. Like um, I, I love serendipity, but um, I don't really believe in it, I guess. <laughs> You've got to be looking for it to find it. Um, okay, so I'm going to wrap up now. Um, I thought it wouldn't be fair to talk about strategy without giving you a clue on where we're going, but I, it, it's a work in progress. We're, we, we're currently, and we still have all the consultation and approval to do, saying library as a destination, so that is a physical, um, welcoming, safe, inspiring destination for the users, the visitors, so everybody that you know we target as our, our, our users, and also our collections, as if they were a person as well. We want them to be um, happy and safe too. Digital collections will definitely be a priority. Develop the living national collection. So this is the way of, um, it's not just the items we hold, but really thinking them as a living record of the country and working to make that a better thing. One national library, so people at the heart of the library are people, but everybody that wants to engage with the library, however they choose to engage. 
And then the one, um, the fifth one is really about what I was talking about, being able to do more, recognising we can't do all we want to do with what we have, the resources we have, so how can we do more through partnership, funding, donors, you know, finding other ways to be able to offer more things. So there's a lot more to do. Um, and that's why I wasn't uh, sure whether I should say um, I should put them up there at all, but I thought, look, I'm, these are all really clear priorities for us, so um, I, I put them up with the proviso that um, they're not fixed, we still have a load more consultation, more thinking, a lot of um, building commitment that's in our community, in our staff, in our users, that this is the right way to go as well. And then after you've done that, you get to say, yay, here's our strategy, we're finished now. No, unfortunately not. Then you have to actually deliver it, so you've got to do your planning, and you have to change practice is really, you know, the, the definitely the hardest thing, um, and then track it and review it and change it, and, you know, just basically that it's not a glossy brochure, but a living thing that we all uh, feel and contribute to. So, I finished by saying, I said in the title it was learning while building, and what I meant is, I do think strategy is a building process, so it's not a, here's one I prepared earlier, it's a very active um, building project, brick by brick. Um, and then I wanted to say on the learning side, so... Um, I'm going to say this was, uh, is and continues to be a very exciting experience for me as a lifelong learner. So I'm mad about um, learning and working through things and um, really trying to understand what's going on. And um, right, uh, setting a strategy is absolutely the most intense experience on that. So the things I would pick out are particularly the learning through challenging and reflecting the purpose and the value of libraries. And I think everybody here, I'm sure you have done this, but it's... I guess, such an important learning thing to reflect on it and to really, really dig into it. The question of what should change and what should stay the same, sometimes I think people assume the value is that you have to change, 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 um, or equally you can get a resistance to change and we've always done that so we should stay the same. I think you can change or you can stay the same as long as you know why you're doing it. Um, that discussion of really fundamental issues about the value of libraries, and um, then for me, coming into the, library, the National Library from outside of it, understanding that um, an organisation is like a living organism. You know, every piece contributes into the body as a whole, and you need to understand them all if you're really going to understand the library. So that's it. Thanks very much. <laughs> Okay, we have time just for a couple of questions because we're really tight on time. So if you want to put your hand up, you want to go around with the roving mic. Anyone? Yeah, uh, Siobhan. No, just, yeah, sorry, we'll get you. Hello? Yeah. I just have a question about the web archiving. So you said you did a domain crawl in 2007 and the next one's going to be 2017. So do you th see that the National Library will set up an annual domain crawl of all the web space, even though you won't have the resources to curate it, but will you preserve it every year? Um, I would love to say yes. Um, I, we, we'll need... We don't have the resources to do it annually at the moment. Um, so. I think what we'll do is we'll do it on um, a, a time period that's bigger than one year. So um, 10 years now, and I'd like to see that up to three or five years over the next period. I see digital as a growth for us. So whatever new resources we can get for the organization that we'd concentrate on this um, new, well, I suppose a specialism for us. But um, at the moment, doing it every year is um, beyond our capability, I would say. Sorry, it's a sad answer. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thanks, Ray. Thanks. Uh, 
that's a really good idea, Marie, <laughs> making notes here. I think that's very interesting. So I'm not always sure that it's in the big tech companies' interest to have the internet archived. You know, they, they have a, um, a personal investment in um, uh, how information is presented in the internet as well. But um, I think that that's a really good idea. So w what we did for 2016, we went, um, the government gave us special funds to harvest and save 2016. And I know that Trinity is, 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 is also, um, through the British illegal deposit, harvesting and saving um, parts of 2016 as well. And that was, the argument around that was it was a, a very important part of the government and a fixed, you know, a fixed body of work. But um, I, I, I would really like to explore that, I think. It could be, I guess, the argument of a, a contribution to the public good by the underpinning, yeah. Yeah, I like it. Thank you. <laughs> I totally agree. And I guess the archiving in, you know, business archiving, um, I think is in its infancy on the, 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 the born digital stuff that each of the companies have. So maybe it's like a shared service. <laughs> OK, <laughs> we're just going to have two more questions. So Siobhan and then Jane. And we'll have to leave it at that then. OK, thank you. Um, Sandra, just to say thanks a million for that. That was a very inspiring and stimulating keynote. And um, you're asking some of the really difficult questions that libraries face. Um, one of the things you mentioned there about how, you know, it's it's easy to provide the metrics and, you know, the purse ring holders are looking at, you know, um, metrics like counting books and things like that. But you mentioned, you know, the real part of what goes on in our libraries around culture <clears throat> and the learning that takes place and those intangibles. How do you go about capturing that activity and convincing those funders that this is where the value is? Do you have any ideas on, on that? Or it's a difficult question, I know. Yeah, it's, re it's, it's really hard. And it's something I'm really, really interested in and looking for opportunities all the time. So sometimes the anecdotal is really powerful. You know, so a, um, a personal testimony, somebody speaking to the value that they got out of the library. And that's, you know, your, your book quotes and everybody responds emotionally to that. And then I think... I suppose what I saw from working in a funding agency is everybody wants an easy answer, not out of badness, but simply out of um, who could put all this time into coming up with a really complete um, answer. It's much harder. And um, you're all chasing, you know, everybody is chasing a number that makes, um, uh, really uh, gives you credit for a whole load of stuff that you feel that you're enabling and you're facilitating and wouldn't be happening if a library wasn't there. But it's, um, a, a lot of it is indirect. So things that we look at is um, the, the story, so the, the, the anecdote or the narrative around it, a personal impact that people can um, uh, emotionally engage with. The wider thing of, um, you know, what's our contribution to society and culture as a wider thing, I don't know, like, I, I don't think that we can take it for granted. That's the thing I feel very much like in saying what your mission is, you're assuming everybody thinks that's a good idea. I think you have to keep recreating it. But I don't think there's any easy answers. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, and last question from uh, Jane. Hi Sandra, congratulations, uh, fantastic presentation. My okay, question thanks. is kind of general. Do you find there's a lot of engagement with the diaspora in terms of say, not only involvement or interest in the library, but perhaps for potential funding? Okay, so that's very interesting. Um, what I think with the parish registers, we got a real boost from that because um, this idea of tracing your Irish roots and everything is so strong. And the Irish diaspora, it's not the, I saw an analysis of the different diasporas and I think we're third on a kind of how this broad, how the size of the community and how strongly it identifies with being Irish. So it's definitely something that is waiting, you know, it's a resource for us to develop. Um, with chasing how we could fund something out of it, I don't know. So I see different models, you know, kind of micro-funding things. What we don't want to do in the library is charge for access. And if you say you're not doing 
that you close down so many you know kind of clever ideas and you know micro payments and small things that you can do but if you take that as a you know a fundamental ethos you really close down a lot of um, different possibilities but it's yeah it's something I'd really like to I don't know whether the the best way to go then is so you can't you can't physically go and meet your full diaspora so you're, you're definitely looking at online and then whether what the diaspora wants is in, in seeking a sense of Ireland and a sense of Irishness and um, the highly curated and visual imagery you know the thing that re you respond to emotionally or if it's really data they want so something like the parish registers which is um, not the same as a beautiful photograph but you know a really valued resource so I think that that's one that we need to figure out which one we can target yeah. Okay, Thanks, thank you.